that is not only for Jews, but also for Gentiles. The New Testament itself makes this very clear. So it is appropriate that its message be communicated to non-Jews in ways that impose on them a minimum of alien Jewish cultural baggage. And this approach has been successful. Millions of Gentiles have come to trust in the God of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, meaning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and in the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, known in English usually as Jesus. However, the time has come to restore the Jewishness of the New Testament, for the New Testament is, in fact, a Jewish book, by Jews, mostly about Jews, and for Jews as well as Gentiles. It is all very well to adapt a Jewish book for easier appreciation by non-Jews, but not at the cost of suppressing its inherent Jewishness. For the central figure of the New Testament, Yeshua the Messiah, was a Jew who was born to Jews in Bethlehem, Bethlehem, grew up among Jews in Nazareth, Nazareth, ministered to Jews in the Galil, Galilee, and died and rose from the grave in the Jewish capital, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, all in Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, which God gave to the Jewish people. Moreover, Yeshua is still a Jew, since he is still alive, and nowhere does Scripture say or suggest that he has stopped being Jewish. His twelve closest followers were Jews. For years, all his Talmidim, all his disciples, were Jews, numbering tens of thousands in Jerusalem alone, according to Acts. The New Testament was written entirely by Jews, Luke being in all likelihood a proselyte to Judaism, and its message is directed quote, to the Jew especially, but equally to the Gentile, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It was Jews who brought the gospel to non-Jews, not the other way round. Shaul, or Paul, the chief emissary to the Gentiles, was a lifelong observant Jew, as is evident from the book of Acts, chapters 16 to the end. Indeed, the main issue in the early Messianic community, often called the church in English, was not whether a Jew could believe in Yeshua, but whether a Gentile could become a Christian without converting to Judaism. The Messiah's vicarious atonement is rooted in the Jewish sacrificial system. The Lord's Supper is rooted in the Jewish Passover. Immersion, or baptism, is a Jewish practice. Yeshua said, Salvation is from the Jews, the Gospel of Yohanan, chapter 4, verse 22. The New Covenant itself was promised by the Jewish prophet Jeremiah, the very concept of a Messiah is exclusively Jewish. Indeed, the entire New Testament completes the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures which God gave to the Jewish people, so that the New Testament without the Old is as impossible as the second floor of a house without the first, and the Old without the New is as unfinished as a house without a roof. Moreover, much of what is written in the New Testament is incomprehensible apart from its Jewish context. Here is an example, only one of many. Yeshua says in the Sermon on the Mount, literally, if your eye be evil, your whole body will be dark. So what is an evil eye? Someone not knowing the Jewish background might suppose Yeshua was talking about casting spells. However, in Hebrew, having an ayin ra'ah, an evil eye, means being stingy, while having an ayin tova, a good eye, means being generous. So Yeshua is simply urging generosity against stinginess. And this understanding fits with the surrounding verses, where your wealth is, there your heart will be also. You can't be a slave to both God and money. But the best demonstration of the New Testament's Jewishness is also the most convincing proof of its truth, namely the number of Tanakh prophecies, all of them centuries older than the New Testament events, which are fulfilled in the person of Yeshua from Nazareth. The probability that anyone could satisfy dozens of prophetic conditions by mere chance is infinitesimal. No pretender to messiahship, such as Shimon bar Kosiba or bar Kokhba in the second century, or Shabtai Tzvi in the seventeenth century, has fulfilled more than a few of these prophecies. Yeshua fulfilled every one of those intended to be fulfilled at his first coming, and I could list fifty-two of them. The rest of the prophecies he will fulfill when he returns in glory to bring peace to mankind. While there are some 100,000 Messianic Jews in English-speaking countries, perhaps more, it is obvious that most Jewish people do not accept Yeshua as the Messiah. 
while the reasons include Christian persecution of Jews, secular worldviews that allow little place for either God or a Messiah, and refusal to turn from sin, a major cause is the perception by Jews that the gospel is irrelevant to them. This perceived irrelevancy arises partly from the way Christianity presents itself. With their Gentile Christian cultural trappings and their anti-Jewish theological underpinnings, they lead many Jews to see the New Testament as a Gentile book about a Gentile God. The Jesus portrayed therein seems to bear little relationship to Jewish life. It becomes hard for a Jew to experience Yeshua the Messiah as who he really is, namely a friend to every Jewish heart. Finally, centuries of Jewish rejection of Yeshua and Christian rejection of Jews has produced a situation today in which it is commonly supposed that Christianity is Christianity and Judaism is Judaism and never the twain shall meet. Moreover, many Jews and Christians are satisfied with this arrangement. But it was not God's will that there be two separate peoples of God. Gentile Christians who recognize that they have joined Israel, not replaced it, and Messianic Jews who identify fully with both the Jewish people and the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, must work together to heal the greatest schism in the history of the world, the split between the church and the Jewish people.
Holding on to our beliefs Like a child holds to its father It's like we're trying so hard to breathe With our heads underneath the water